All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Lucas, and this is joint work with Stephen. And today I'm going to be telling you a bit about obfuscating finite automata. So let me start with a quick introduction. So first of all, you have to know that general purpose obfuscation is incredibly hard. There are results that say that, for example, generic virtual black box obfuscation is impossible. Now, if you study a bit the literature, you will find that indistinguishable, indistinguishability obfuscation, for example, is very infeasible for now. And I'm, I'm sure that there's lots of work to be done that can actually speed up these constructions. So maybe we should just give up and stop caring about obfuscation, just refocus on, on other tasks in cryptography. But maybe not so fast, because there is this little area which we lovingly call special purpose obfuscation that, that we really should consider. And the idea there is to actually look at bite-sized problems and try to solve those. And this has been very successful in the past. So a few buzzwords there. We can obfuscate point functions. We know how to obfuscate hyperplane membership. We can do conjunctions. We have also pattern matching with wildcards, which is pretty much the same as conjunctions. Recently, we had a solution that allows us to obfuscate fuzzy Hamming distance matching. There are solutions for compute and compare programs that are kind of feasible, etc. And all of these are um, under the umbrella of special purpose obfuscation, I would say. Now, there are a few open problems still in, in special purpose obfuscation. So let me start with a quick list of, of things that kind of build up on each other. So we know how to obfuscate point functions. And these you can generalize a bit into conjunctions. So it's point functions where we, where we allow wildcards for some of the coordinates. And then there is a, another sort of generalization, which is fuzzy Hamming distance matching, where we don't really look at a, a single point to be the same, but we, we look at the point to lie in a, in a Hamming ball. And this gives us secure sketches and fuzzy expectors. And now we can think of a, a yet another generalization of this problem, which is well, how do you do finite automata that match a string? And from that, you could get regular expressions and substring matches. OK, so this is the problem that we are going to consider in this work. Now, there's a paper by Janice et al. And they give a solution for interactive finite automata. And by that, we mean um, that you can match an automata, but you don't get the solution, uh, the, the, the answer of the automata immediately. And an application they give is antivirus signatures. So their idea is to use fully homomorphic encryption to evaluate a secret automaton on a public input. And then this produces an encrypted state vector, which contains the answer of the matching. But uh, the user can't really decrypt the state vector because the FHE key is, for example, hidden on a server. So what the user would have to do is then um, send the, decrypted, the encrypted state vector back to a server. The server can then use the secret to decrypt it and answer back to the user. And there's, some, there's a level of interactivity going on because you actually have to connect back and forth between the user and the server. And that's why we call this interactive. And it's not quite an obfuscation scheme. And there is also another little pitfall that they fail to mention, namely that you cannot simply consider arbitrary automatons because there's a result that tells you that you can actually learn an automaton from, ex from its accept reject behavior. And this is a problem that we will actually fix by restricting to a certain class of automatons. And then there's also a flip side scheme described by the Smoulins et al. And what they do is more in a sense of, say, searchable encryption, where you actually match a public automaton on encrypted inputs. But this is not what we will consider here. We will really consider secret automatas and public inputs in a non-interactive fashion. And this is what's going to yield an obfuscator for automata. Now, remember the problems that we said, the bite-sized problems that we said at the start, these for, for which we had special purpose obfuscators. And there is actually a common theme there, namely that all of these problems were actually evasive. So, what do we mean by an invasive problem? So the idea is to consider a class of programs for which the, the members are almost constant. So really, I want to have programs such that they evaluate always to one, except in a negligible somehow 
some set of inputs. Or I could have them evaluate always to zero and only evaluate one in what I said, a negligible subset of inputs. And then a collection of such programs we will call evasive. And what we're going to do again is we will focus on evasive programs, since, since we saw that many of those actually have special purpose of this program. Now, in the same spirit, we shall consider evasive finite automaton. So just completely the same as before, instead of considering an evasive program collection, we will consider an evasive finite automata collection, namely a collection of automata that are almost constant. Now, but there are a little observation that we have to make here is namely that we actually restrict the inputs to polynomial size inputs. And we need to do this because it's quite subtle, but you can probably understand that we could allow an input that contains all possible substrings of a certain length. And then the, the problem would start to become meaningless. So we really need to consider polynomial size inputs. And again, this ties back into that you can possibly learn the structure of a non-invasive finite automaton from the input except reject behavior. That's why we really need to restrict to evasive finite Okay. So let me tell you the key ideas of, of the paper. So first of all, we want to represent a deterministic finite automaton, a DFA, by its transition matrices. I will explain later what that means. Now, we restrict to DFAs because for a DFA, the states can be represented by canonical basis vectors. So we're really talking about a, a vector of length r, such that it has a single one entry and all the other L entries are zero. And this is very important as well. Then we use a matrix graded encoding scheme to encrypt the transition matrices. And this will allow us to evaluate the hidden DFA on a plain text input by simply multiplying the encoded matrices. Now, this is not quite enough because the evaluated automaton will again be an encoded element. So now you might ask yourself, well, how do you get a plain text answer? And for this, we need a matrix encoding scheme that actually supports a limited zero testing. So in general, usually if you talk about matrix or any graded encoding scheme, you have arbitrary zero testing. But for our applications, we actually find that a very limited zero testing is more than enough. Now, what we need is to decide whether the last coordinate of an encrypted vector is zero or not. And that will be enough for us. And this is completely different to arbitrary zero testing schemes where you can actually decide whether a whole matrix is zero or whether a whole vector is all, is all entry zero. For us, it will be enough to just decide whether the last coordinate of a vector is zero. Okay, let me tell you a bit about transition matrices as I promised before. Now, imagine you have a DFA that has R states, and it takes input symbols in an alphabet sigma. Now, there is a transformation of this DFA to be represented by um, cardinality of sigma many transition matrices, let's call them M sub sigma, that have entries in 0 and 1 and that are of size R times R. And what these matrices do is they act on a state vector V with entries in 0 and 1. But actually what we find is that these vectors in the end are really just the ca uh, canonical basis vector. And what we are going to do in our application is we are going to choose the matrices in a very specific form. Namely, we want that for the first set of possible input symbols, the last row is always zero. And only for the last possible input symbol, we choose a very special form in the lower right corner. And then what we do is we identify the last canonical basis vector ER with the accepting state. And this form of matrices just um, implies certain security guarantees of which you can read more about in the paper. But let me tell you that you can always choose a matrix representation of this form possibly by just um, introducing an extra input symbol and adding an extra state and sort of reordering your automaton. So finding a form like this is always possible. And now we said that the rth canonical basis vector 
namely the vector that has a zero in the last coordinate, uh, that has a one in the last coordinate and the zero everywhere else is going to be the accepting state. And earlier we said that our zero test needs to be able to detect whether this coordinate is zero or not. So the limited zero test can actually detect this vector. And this is what we're going to use to actually get an answer out of our encrypted automata. Now, what, with which matrix encoding system are we going to use? So we chose to use the HAO15 matrix encoding scheme by Hiromasa et al. And this is actually, in, in the start, it's just an FHE scheme. So it does not support zero testing at all. And what we are going to do is we will add in this zero testing algorithm later. So let me quickly tell you, it's um, a lattice-based encoding scheme over this ring set mod QZ for some modulus Q. And let me quickly tell you how you encode matrices and vectors. Imagine you're giving a matrix with entries in zero and one or a vector with entries in zero and one of size R times R. Then the encodings, big C or small c, of these matrices live in a higher dimensional space and they satisfy the following um, equations that you can see there in the middle, where E is some noise parameter and beta is a scaling constant. And now the important part of this matrix encoding scheme is that we actually have homomorphic um, properties that let us multiply encoded matrices or uh, apply encoded matrices to encoded vectors, which corresponds to multiplying plain text matrices or applying plain, plain text matrices to plain text vectors. And you can see how it's defined there in the lower line via this gadget matrix G. And um, so we, we write dot with a circle around for, for this encoded product, basically. Okay, this is all we need. Then let me tell you a bit about the zero testing. So the zero testing works by giving out the last row of the secret matrix of the FHE scheme. And then using this formula that you can see here, the last entry of a plain text vector VR can be computed from an encoded vector C by multiplying it with the last row of the secret and mod Q and dividing by beta and rounding. This is a very common uh, theme in, the, in, in fully homomorphic encryption. And I'm sure some of you will actually, will actually um, be reminded of, of this formula from, from other works. Now, another thing you have to know is with all graded encoding schemes, you always have a maximum grading because you can see that this is a lattice problem-based algorithm. And as is common in lattice problems, there's always a noise in play. And now multiplying encoded matrices or applying encoded matrices to vectors accumulates noise. So you can see that you can only multiply a finite amount of matrices before the noise level go grows too big and decryption actually fails. And if the noise level grows too big, zero testing will fail as well. So really, we need to restrict to, to a maximum maximal grading kappa, which corresponds to the number of possible matrix multiplications. And you can show that for a DFA, represented by DFA matrices with, er, with entries in zero and one, and state vectors that are basically canonical basis vectors, the maximal grading is bounded by the following formula. And this formula you can use in practice to estimate the number of possible input symbols that your DFA will be able to process. Okay, so let me tell you quickly a bit about the correctness, namely that it's really not for us to just have the last row of the basis vector to detect whether the last entry in the vector is zero or one. So imagine you're giving an input word W in the alphabet. Now what you do in practice is you compute this product of encoded DFA matrices and you apply it to an encoding of the first canonical basis vector, which we just imagine to be the starting state of the automata. Now this corresponds actually to a plain text computation of just plain text transition matrices applied to the state vector. So CW, C sub W is an, an encoding of the vector T. And we say that the automaton accepts the input if T, the final state, is the rth canonical basis vector. This is just what we define to be the accepting state. Now, if you have the last row of the secret, you can actually plug it into the defining equation of the HAO15 encoding, 
And you will see that using the last row of the secret applied to the encoding C sub W of the state T, you exactly recover a vector that has PR, namely the last entry of our plain text vector in the last coordinate. And using this formula, you can see the correctness of our scheme, namely that given the last row of the secret, we can really recover the last entry of the state vector. And this will be enough, because if the last entry of the state vector is one, we know that the automaton has accepted the input. If the last entry of the state vector is zero, we know that we are not in an accepted state, namely that the state vector has been any of the other canonical basis vectors. But because we only have the last row of the secret, we don't find out which one of the states it was. So the state that is not the accepting state will be hidden from us. Okay, and let me quickly tell you a bit about the security properties. So because we are modifying uh, an existing FHE scheme, we need to modify our security assumptions. To this. And this is the security assumption that we came up with in this case. Namely, we call it DFA security for the HAO15 scheme. So the idea here is, if you have two matrices M and M prime with entries in zero one, such that they differ by at most one entry in some row, but not the last row. So the encodings look like they do in the middle, S times C is M is G plus E, and S times C prime is M prime is G plus E prime. Then, we say that HAO15 is DFA secure for these matrices if the following two distributions are computationally indistinguishable. I give you the last row of the secret, I give you all the encoded matrices for the alphabet, and I give you some possibly auxiliary information, then you should not be able to distinguish it from an encoding of the other matrix M prime that, as we said, differs by at most one entry in some row, but not the last row. And this will be the security definition um, that, that, that this will be the security property that we assume. And using this security property, we can actually show that for evasive DFAs, our obfuscator is a virtual black box obfuscator. So we end up with the following theorem. Namely, if we assume a distribution of evasive DFAs, possibly with some auxiliary information, I will tell you a bit about that later. And if we assume that HAO15 for this distribution is actually DFA secure, which was the definition I gave you in the previous slide, then we obtain the result that the obfuscator is a DBB obfuscator for this distribution. And now here, a DFA evasive distribution with auxiliary information. This is the auxiliary information that I was talking about beforehand. This just means that if I sample a DFA from this distribution, given some auxiliary information, we assume that the DFA is still evasive. It's just a little technicality that we need for the security proof. Okay, let me finish up with a conclusion. So what we did was, we started from the HAO15 matrix, fully homomorphic encryption scheme. We extended it by a limited zero testing primitive. And I really want to stress this. This is a limited zero testing primitive and not a full zero testing primitive. Now, next, we represent finite automatons by transition matrices. We encode these using the HAO15 scheme. And then we can actually evaluate a hidden automaton on a plain text input simply by multiplying together encoded matrices, which we select depending on an input. And we also said that we really need to restrict the evasive DFAs because otherwise, simply from black box access to a DFA, we can actually learn the structure and this is something we don't want. Because then there is really no point in talking about obfuscation of a program if you can learn the program from black box access. And finally, for our subset of evasive DFAs and our obfuscation scheme, we actually obtain a VBB obfuscator for evasive DFAs. And in particular, as we've seen before, which was an open problem and up until now, is that this actually solves the problem of obfuscated substring matches. Okay, thank you very much, and I will leave you with a few references. <laughs>